This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us once again on Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Dice, and we are joined this weekend by a special guest, Nomi Prinz, uh, a name you may or may not be familiar with. But if by any chance you are not, please go to her website, Nomi Prinz, N-O-M-I-P-R-I-N-S dot com, to find out more about her. She is a uh, very prolific writer. She's written several books, uh, both nonfiction and actually historical novels about uh, stock market crises and the Fed and central banking. And she knows what she speaks of, having been a uh, managing director at Goldman Sachs and also worked at the former Lehman Brothers. She appears uh, with some degree of frequency on all the various uh, talking head shows and the financial shows on cable. So uh, we're very pleased to be joined by Nomi this weekend. So first of all, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff, for having me on. Well, let me just throw this out. Our audience, which we are always expanding, hoping to expand, is mostly anti-Fed libertarians. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So can you tell me, uh, would it be safe or accurate to describe you as an anti-Fed uh, person from the left, a left populist? How would you describe yourself? Um, that's interesting. I uh, Because I, I have an affinity towards libertarians that want to get rid of the Fed, um, <laughs> um, which is why we're talking also, I think, as well. I, I, I am a, a left wing person, um, progressive, but I also have done a fair amount of studying analysis. I even spoke at the Fed last year. Um, about how the dangers of the way in which the Fed was A, constructed, and B, has evolved over history, in particular history of the last almost now decade, but since the financial crisis, um, has really been destabilizing for um, not just markets, but for our economy as a total. And so one of the, one of the perspectives I've come from, which is actually different from a lot of people on the, on the progressive side or on the left, is that um, the Fed actually isn't a democratic body. Um, it really wasn't designed to help the greater populace, uh, the, the citizens of this country, or even the small businesses of this country. It was designed by bankers to be for bankers, and that's how it has operated. Though, again, in the past almost decade, it has done that on steroids, um, and that's dangerous. Well, I have to say, from my perspective, it seems like inherently the most anti-democratic institution one can imagine. I mean, who are these people out there who think it's democratic? Well, this is, again, this, this goes back to, to, to many um, progressives. Um, and, and in particular, during this election period, it's been interesting to see how uh, people that really never even talked about the Fed have come out sort of in support of um, how it is helping the economy. And that's largely been a story that has been created out of Washington and by this administration, and it is, you know, it, it is the Democrat uh, administration of, of Obama. I mean, honestly, it could probably have been a Republican administration as well that would have been supporting the Fed if it was doing what it was doing during these eight years, which was um, basically funneling liquidity into the banking system. Mm. So you, you could take credit for that either way if you want to look at the economy as having improved or not, and any, any administration in power wants to believe it improved. So the story that has happened out of this administration um, has been that since the financial crisis, um, everything that has happened has solidified our economy, that the numbers are better, you know, the job figures are better, that the um, banks are stabilized and, in fact, are, are better regulated than they were beforehand, and, and none of that's really true. Um, and where the Fed comes in is for the last, you know, as we know, as, as you, I'm sure, have discussed here many times, has has created a, a bottom of, of zero for, for rates. It has bought back um, Treasury bonds, which effectively the Treasury Department has created in order to be sold through the banks back to the Fed. So it's, it's not even a, a situation where this debt's being taken out of the market. It's, be, it's being created in order to go back to the Fed's books to be able to contain rates at the zero levels at which they are. Um, and the byproduct of that is that it also enables banks that have also sold some of their more toxic assets to the Fed um, in return for loans or in return for keeping rates low, um, have been able to value securities they have left on their books at higher levels than they would otherwise have been without these low rates. Because if you're evaluating um, any type of a security with any kind of a fixed or floating income as a bank, it's going to evaluate higher if there's a buyer for it, which has been the Fed, um, or if rates are low then its prices are going to go up. So in both of those instances, that's what's happened, and that's distorted um, bank health appearance, um, as well as obviously having all this extra free money floating around the markets, which has created market bubbles, asset bubbles, and risk bubbles. Well, it sounds like a uh, cynic might call this corporate welfare in the form of a moral hazard, wouldn't you say, for these uh, companies and these banks? 
Yeah, it, it, it's corporate welfare. It's it's financial welfare for the banks, as as we also have seen in the last um, eight years or so that this process has been ongoing. Um, the larger banks, the big six banks in this country have become bigger. So if we look at in totality, um, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, collectively, um, they are 30 percent bigger in terms of their asset pools than they were before the crisis. So it's been a benefit to them by a lot. I mean, just imagine it's like a normal citizen running a small business and all of a sudden you actually do have the government helping you increase the assets of your business by 30 percent. That would be pretty awesome. Um <laughs> But that is not what happened. This this happened to a very select group of very powerful institutions who wrecked the economy and took advantage of the financial system and committed crimes. Um, so it would be like, as an individual small business, you would have committed a crime, be that rigging your markets, lying to your customers, you know, faking your taxes, whatever it is you might have done, um, gotten fined for that crime, as the banks have done to multiple billions of dollars, um, and then got subsidized for that crime by by the Federal Reserve. And obviously, it doesn't happen in, 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 in greater America that that happens um, because of the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the banks. So, um, and that was a relationship that goes back to, to history. When I, um, when I wrote All the President's Bankers, um, which was the last book I wrote, I actually went to Jekyll Island, where the Federal Reserve was first conceived in 1910 by a senator, um, by Nelson Aldrich, and, and a bunch of bankers who were, who were connected um, in some manner to the Morgan Bank, which was the largest bank in the country at the time, the most powerful, the most politically connected, as J.P. Morgan Chase is today which is a, a, a legacy bank of, of the Morgan Bank. Um, and, and that was one of the ways in which uh, the Federal Reserve got conceived. And then the, the concept of it got, got mixed and watered down and watered up and so forth along the years until it was passed as, as an act in the, in the end of 1913 under, under a Democratic presidency. Um, but the idea of the Fed that was sold to the public versus the idea of the Fed that was created were two different things even back then, even at its, at its conception. The idea sold to the public was it would provide credit to the country when the big banks couldn't in the event of a crisis, in the event of a panic, um, country had undergone a panic in 1907, some years before the Federal Reserve was, was created, and that this money would basically be used, among other things, for the farmers of the country, which was a big um, you know, sort of group of people that, that, that needed credit when credit was tight and so forth. Um, and none of that happened. What happened was, of course, instead that these banks were subsidized over the years, um, they in turn helped the government uh, subsidized wars, and so there was a, a, a quid pro quo in terms of the largest banks in the country, their political connections to Washington, and so forth. Um, but but history is very clear on, on on why the Fed was created, and what history is less clear on is the extent to which the Fed has overstepped, even the reasons for which it was created in the wake of this financial crisis and, and ongoing with, with no appearance that anything's going to change because at this point they're in a catch-22. You raise rates, you tank the economy or, or the global economy, you know, everyone who's basically has to pay back um, the debt that they borrowed in dollars um, if the dollar goes up, if rates go up. And um, you're in this, uh, we're in this really bad situation where, where the behavior of the Federal Reserve in connection with the government in connection with these banks has, has created a very unnatural, artificial marketplace and economy. Well, that's interesting. Let's go back to the uh, justification for the creation of the Fed. What you're saying in terms of its original uh, raison d'etre sounds a lot like what we might call a right populist perspective we get today from, let's say, David Stockman, who's not an Austrian, but he says the Fed was supposed to be a backstop. It was supposed to be a banker's bank. And when banks run afoul through their own mismanagement of, of liquidity or solvency uh, issues, then if they go to the Fed, it ought to be a penalty window, not a discount window. Is, does this make sense to you? Do you agree with this? Well, that that is a very fair way of, of, of making the Fed operate. But that, that wasn't, you know, if, if we were to do that, that if the banks really need money, just like if people really need money, if you need to, to get a loan at the last minute, if your credit is bad, you will be paying more interest for that money. In the case of the banking system, because of this evolution of what we now consider too big to fail, but this was, you know, it, it, they, these, the, the biggest banks today were the biggest banks 100 years ago, 100 plus years ago when the Fed was created, to an extent. 
um, the evolution of the banks that were at the meetings, the initial meetings for the Federal Reserve, um, were basically the same banks that operate today. You know, J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, back then there was people from the Morgan Bank. There was people from the Morgan Bank that ultimately became Morgan Stanley. Um, Goldman Sachs was the one bank that wasn't involved in the Fed conception, but uh, you know, sort of worked its way into availing itself of the discount window in the beginning of the financial crisis when it became a bank um, like those big banks. But but the evolution and, and, and what was sold, it actually, there, there was a Republican um, government in place when these meetings first happened in 1910 um, and also 1912 under Howard Taft, and he was a big proponent of the Fed. And Nelson Aldrich, who was the senior senator from Rhode Island pushing for the Fed, you know, also a Republican, and, and many of the bankers who were involved were, were Republicans as well. And, and, and there was a populist kind of Republican um, appeal within Washington, but it was still supported by the bankers and supported by senators who were connected to the bankers. For example, Nelson Aldrich's um, nephew, Winthrop Aldrich, became the head of Chase for a couple decades, not long after the period where where the Federal Reserve was created. I mean, he was he was in Chase, and then sort of it was it was in the period of the Depression. But the point is, he had been in Chase for a very long time. So, so the families, the connections, really go back politically and financially, and, and and have continued within the largest banks for for multiple years. The Rockefeller family and the Aldrich family got married to each other way back in the turn of the last century. And the Rockefeller family, and this is not a conspiracy, this is just actual fact. Or the Aldrich family was running Chase for a good fifty or sixty years. And they, there was another family, the Stillman family, was running Citigroup, or what was then National Citibank, that became Citigroup for multiple decades. So you had these basically three families running, running Wall Street and having very tight political connections as well. So that's why it really happened. That the idea that it would funnel through money into the rest of the country was was the pitch, and it was a pitch that was then adopted by Woodrow Wilson when he became a Democratic president um, in 1912. He, he adopted that pitch and, and sort of sold it to the American public. Um, so the idea would not be that the Fed was being created for the banks, but that it was being created for them. Well, it, it sounds like the FBI is about to kick your door down with their dogs out there. But, I, I, it's, uh, it's, you know, this is so interesting, though. I mean, fast forward now to the to the modern situation. I, I think you're, you're really well qualified to talk about this unholy nexus, this revolving door between people who work at the Fed, people who work in the Treasury Department, and people who work on Wall Street at places like Goldman Sachs. There seems to be a nexus, and, and we, we sense as Americans that it's not right, but we don't understand it. Right. The idea is, and it, it, it has its legacy history, and we see it unfolding more now, which is that um, if we just look at this crisis as just 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 a window, right? So the, going into the crisis, the, the Treasury Secretary for George W. Bush was Hank Paulson, who had been um, the CEO and chairman of Goldman Sachs during the time in which a lot of the types of securities and credit-related securities that were eventually deemed to be toxic or were, were toxic as they were being created, but were, were shown to be toxic in total, were being manufactured and sort of ignored it. Um, you had as the head of the New York Fed, which is one of the 12 groups of the Fed that is the most powerful, the most connected to Wall Street. In fact, I mean, it's right there. It's right next to J.P. Morgan Chase. It's right next to where Goldman headquarters was and so forth. You know, these are all within walking distances of each other as well. Tim Geithner. Now, Tim Geithner being the president of the New York Fed, Hank Paulson being the uh, Treasury Secretary, um, that was a very powerful combination of people. One was a Democrat, one was a Republican, one had come from inside Goldman Sachs, one had come from inside Washington. But collectively, the two of them were architects of a bailout that, again, disproportionately helped the banking system through the Federal Reserve. Now, we pu publicly know the bailout to have been a very small $700 billion uh, TARP fund that was passed by Congress, but that was only a very minor portion of all of the benefits and aids that were given mostly through the Federal Reserve and in conjunction with the Treasury Department to the banking system. So, so the people that came from the banking system supported the banking system through the Treasury Department and through the Federal Reserve. They just kind of all helped their friends. Again, not a conspiracy. This is just these are just how the events ultimately um, unfolded. Now, Tim Geithner went from the New York Fed to becoming the Treasury Secretary for Obama. It should also be noted he had been a deputy treasury secretary under Bill Clinton during the time at which Wall Street was deregulated um, and Glass-Steagall, which was the act that had basically separated um, people's deposits within banks from these more risky types of speculative bets that we ultimately had to bail out. He was effectively someone who had been a front row seat on that. 
as had been Robert Rubin, who was the Treasury Secretary of Bill Clinton, who was the co-CEO at one point of Goldman Sachs. So again, it's not only, and this is really kind of key when you look at the history of now, these people do revolve in and out of Wall Street and in and out of Washington more like crucial to us than their actual physical presence in their spots um, is the ideologies that follow them. So the ideology of Tim Geithner, who was a more junior deputy secretary of treasury in Bill Clinton's administration, followed him through the New York Fed, followed him into Obama's administration as a treasury secretary and enabled him to stand back and say, yeah, we actually can use our government and our Federal Reserve system to benefit these, this small group of firms that had so much collective power over the finances and the economy of the country. So it's the people and it's, it's the, the way they think. Um, and, and, and the entitlement of that thinking that allows them to step between private and public office and use one to benefit the other before considering the benefits or the negatives to the rest of the population or the rest of the economy. Well, I mean, that's music to our ears that it's, it's a systemic or an ideological problem rather than, uh, you know, dependent on what person you put in or what reform you place. Uh, speaking of the crash of 08 and the TARP bailout that you mentioned, do you agree with David Stockman that the, what he calls the BlackBerry panic would not have spread to, to Main Street USA, that if we had allowed some of these firms uh, that lacked liquidity to cover their margin calls, if we had allowed them to go under like we did Lehman uh, that that the the country as a whole would have been okay. Well, no, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Not only would the country have been okay, we could have, for example, as a country, as people in government. I, I wrote about this, and it takes a pillage. We could have, um, for the amount of money that we we, i.e. the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department has spent, has created in debt and so forth to to subsidize this flawed system um, that has been allocated into it could have used a fraction of that to basically even save the subprime market, which was uh, basically the kernel of all the toxic assets that were manufactured on Wall Street, sold throughout the world, leveraged against, and so forth. So if we had just taken, um, basically it was, it was a half a trillion dollars worth of subprime loans that were underwater, right? There was $14 trillion worth of toxic assets that were created. There's about $140 trillion worth of sort of money sloshing around between borrowing and leveraging into those assets. So you take a half a trillion dollars and you create $140 trillion of junk um, or, or loans for junk. And that was basically what was, what was being, you know, quote, saved. Had we even taken a half a trillion dollars and just bought out all those subprime mortgages for even those people? And I know that's not a libertarian thing, but if we had just done that, it would have been cheaper it would have stopped the bloodshed of the toxic assets. Anyone who was still holding too many, any bank that was holding too many should have been allowed to fail. Um, and you actually could have sustained the whole economy without having zero interest rates, without people um, being concerned that they can't have savings accounts with any real value or interest attached to them and so forth. So there were two ways that, could have, that things could have gone down. In the absence of plugging the subprime loans for people um, and to contain the entire crisis, the other alternative would have been to let more banks fail and not have this option to have eight years of subsidies, which in, in, instead is, is what has happened. And not only have they had subsidies, they have gotten away with so many crimes. You know, these institutions, just the, the big six banks I mentioned before, have paid over 100 or agreed to pay over $160 billion worth of fines for, for actual illegal activities, not simply related to the subprime mortgage market, but, you know, rigging the foreign exchange market, rigging the LIBOR rate market um, from which mortgages are priced, you know, and all sorts of other things. And their leaders get away with doing that, and their companies continue to be to be maintained by effectively the government through the Federal Reserve. So I believe they should have been allowed to fail. I believe some of the subprime mortgages could have also been contained far more cheaply. And we have we would have a much more honest economy. I believe it would be healthier. I would believe it'd be more authentic. The values in the market would be the values in the market. There wouldn't be as much debt floating around that would have been had to created by the Treasury Department to basically sell through the Fed to subsidize these low rates. Companies wouldn't be buying back their stock at these kinds of intense levels, which would mean that, again, that the values of their stock would be more realistic and they would have to basically produce more or innovate more in order to have higher values rather than simply buy into them. I mean, so many things would be healthier and, and uh, more real if 
these banks have been allowed to fail. And if there also been, in, in my opinion, a, a separate subsidy for actually the, the mortgages and individuals who had been screwed by these banks. I mean, isn't that incredible, ladies and gentlemen, to think of? We could have literally paid these these people's mortgages. Think how much healthier the, those people in their individual lives in our country would be. Um, you know, I noticed recently that CNN, of all places, had aired a program about how and why the Fed is not political. It almost seemed like there's a charm offensive going on here uh, because, frankly, monetary policy and the Fed have never been campaign issues uh, really before Ron Paul 2008. So talk about this. Talk about the politicization of the Fed or the perception that is politicized. Yeah, what's interesting is is that the the Fed has been political, you know, since its inception. It, it was it was created by politicians and bankers. I mean, you can't get much more um, inside the Beltway than that. that. That's what happened. I mean, just just that story before that I said the, the, the history of it was that Nelson Aldrich, the, the senator, couldn't even make it up to Washington from Jekyll Island after the first meeting because he actually was sick. He had been hit by a trolley car on Madison Avenue visiting his banker's son before this meeting ever happened, and it was two bankers that went up to present. Uh, the initial plan of this of, of the Fed to the senators in Washington. So I mean, you know, it, it just goes on and on. So the idea that it's it's not a political body um, is rather odd. It is a body that is focused on the financial system. It's focused on the largest banks, but the largest banks are also political, right? I mean, you 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 have all of these uh, aside from the revolving door individuals that we just talked about, the ideologies that all of these individuals are are bent on preserving in terms of you know using the government to help themselves and to let themselves off when they commit crimes. I mean, these are all political activities, um, i.e., they are only affected if politicians are involved. And those politicians could be the president. Those politicians could be Janet Yellen, who is appointed by the president and and endorsed by 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 Congress. Yes, there's there's a technical check and balance on that. There's never been an appointee that has gone through uh, to be head of the Federal Reserve. There's certainly been ones that have been batted about before that point, but that has been presented to the Senate that has not gone through. Um, if anything, Ben Bernanke had a, had a problem with his with his. Um, reappointment, but but everybody gets through. That's a political decision. That's, that's politicians in Congress choosing to, you know, take someone that is involved in their system and, and, and put them through and, and have them be in charge of a body that supports the political financial system. So this is a long way of saying that there's so many different avenues of politicization of, of the Fed from its inception to today. That's hard for me to really understand why would why one wouldn't think it was political, but also that this is not new. You know, so the fact that Donald Trump has kind of brought it up as as, as saying most recently that it that it is a political organization and 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 I think that has um you know created this this extra flack for the idea of it being a political organization. I, I think that's that's just wrong simply because it's been a political organization for a really long time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's not forget that Congress created the Fed statutorily and presumably inherent in that it has the ability to regulate the Fed in any manner up to and including repealing the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, you know, Nomi, you have written about a subject that absolutely fascinates our listeners, which is central banking and foreign policy. There's a, a longstanding libertarian critique of not just the Fed, but all central banks that they are war financiers. Can you talk about this, how, how central banking and foreign policy interact? Well, yes. I mean, again, domestically in, in the US um, and then internationally, the first world war that, that happened right after the Fed was created, and I'm going to go back in history, because again, history really just, just informs us, but 1914, when the first world war broke out, J.P. Morgan was well, basically Jack Morgan, his son. J.P. Morgan died right before the um, the act was passed. But his son was up in Washington talking to Woodrow Wilson, um, who was president at the time, and basically saying, you know, we just passed this Fed thing. Um, and there was a little bit of a concern that there could be, and there was some pushback as to some of the language in the Federal Reserve Act and, and the idea it would be there just for banks. There, there was a little pushback at the time after it was passed. Um, but then the war broke out and Jack Morgan was like, look, you know, we have a lot of money here at the Morgan Bank, and, and they basically were going to help the Treasury Department and the United States government if they needed to be in a war, finance the war. And if the U.S. wasn't going to be in the war, then they would finance the allies of the U.S. in the war. And then there was issues in terms of which bank supported which side of the war and so forth. But these were actual conversations um, that took place. I mean, I, I, I go through some of them in the book between uh, Morgan and, and, and Wilson about how the banks were there to help the Fed, and the Fed was there to help the banks. So that was how the Federal Reserve was 
was was established. Um, in in any scenario, if you have the private banking system, as as that exemplified in the U.S., supporting a war effort, right? Supporting um, whether that's lending to allies, whether that's lending to for weaponry, whether that's subsidizing, you know, s- certain. Um, arsenals that, that need to be built up from the standpoint of the military, wh- whatever it is, you know, things need to be financed. And the partnership between financing of what's happening if it, with a big bank, what's happening through the government, and what's happening with the Federal Reserve or any central bank is very connected because if banks have a problem with providing private financing into that arena, into the military arena, well, then the Federal Reserve or the Bundesbank or the Bank of England or, or whoever is involved has to come up with, with some way of, of fortifying those banks. And at the same time, the government can also rely on them. We don't do this anymore, but, but, you know, through our world wars to, you know, issue war, war bonds or just sort of allow things to be financed through, through, through different channels. We don't do this anymore. Now it's just more um, connected between central banks and, and, and private banks. And also we have a large defense budget now, which we didn't necessarily have back in the day. And so that, that allows financing as well, but where the private banks are involved in any of that, um, any of that connection into private companies that also finance wars and because they are also associated with federal reserve that provides them now cheaper money. And because that's all connected to the government, any kind of military operation has some connection to um, that triangle. Well, summarize for us from your perspective, how central banks exacerbate inequality. There's a lot of talk about income and wealth inequality. There's a lot of talk about cronyism. If you were just to grab an average uh, lay person on the street of average intelligence, how would you explain to him or her how central banks increase or worsen inequality? Well, it, it's as simple. You know, I talk to someone on the street who has to pay if they have a credit card, you know, on average, say 15, 16%, they could be paying 12, they could be paying 29. I mean, it really just depends on the person, their credit rating, but, you know, just pick a number um, where banks are getting that money at 0%. That that's a level of inequality right there. Um, if, if if they're going to use that card at sixteen percent, for which a bank is getting money at zero, um, if they have money at the bank, they are basically paying banks today to keep their money. So if you have just a thousand dollars as a you know someone who doesn't have a lot of money in a bank and you're paying twenty dollars a month um, as a fee because that's all you have in your bank account to any of these big private banks, that's two hundred and forty dollars a year. So you're basically paying a bank twenty four percent interest on your money um, in order just to have it be with them. So how does that how does that create any quality. Well, all of your money gets penalized, whereas all the banks get this money cheaply and free and they can do whatever they want with it, including commit crimes and, and, and be subsidized. So so that's just how inequality ultimately spurs at the bottom level. That's just you and your bank account and your bank. But if you take that in, in an even larger context, um, so you're getting dinged along the way, the bank isn't. The bank is now subsidizing companies and, and using its own resources to get involved in the markets, to speculate, to you know work in the derivatives markets and so forth, to enhance their profit, to enhance the profit of their CEOs, of the executives in their company. All of that money is basically coming from all of those dings along the way to the average person. So basically, you're paying um, to subsidize these banks. If you're paying to subsidize anything, you're at a disadvantage, they're at an advantage. Inequality is about the, the gap between financially your disadvantage um, and someone else's advantage. And so the larger the ability of a financial institution to get money for free, and the harder it is to make money as an individual plus be penalized for financial normal activities as an individual, the greater inequality is going to be. And in fact, the Federal Reserve did a study uh, a couple of years ago where they acknowledged in their own reports that the actions that they had undertaken since the financial crisis had coincided with a widening of inequality in individuals um, throughout the country. It's also coincided with wider inequality in the world. So within each country, the central banks have created inequality in their own countries. And then between countries, that means that the countries that were weaker to begin with have become more so. um, And the countries that were stronger to begin with have become more so. But within them, there's more inequality as well. Well, let me leave you with one last uh, political question. Isn't the Fed an unbelievably ripe area for populist agreement where where a Ralph Nader and a Pat Buchanan can come together and say, you know, this isn't working for the American people. We can change this politically on a single issue basis. 
I, I, I think it is. I mean, also, and, and I was a part of this when Bernie Sanders was, was um, before he ran, he was one of the big proponents, along with Ron Paul, of auditing the Fed, um, at the very least, um, and looking at how they went about behind the scenes subsidizing the largest financial institutions here and globally. Um, and, and that was a very, a very good fertile area for coming together and saying, you know, what are these people even doing? And why net of whether they should exist or not. So, so I, I definitely think it is that the issue is is seeing the Fed on both sides is seeing the Fed as detrimental to economic stability as opposed to believing that because it's subsidizing the financial system, that that that's better than actually fixing the problems in the financial system. Um, and that's that's a separate issue. That's that's a perception issue, and and that needs to be a. a worked out. But but yeah, this is definitely an area where, where the left and the right can come together. You know, Nader has talked about it. And as I said, Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul had worked on things together. I mean, these, this is definitely an area where, you know, some progressives and, and some libertarians and conservatives all, all agree as well. This is this is an outside body where it is not political. It's, it's unelected. It's merely appointed. So I guess that's the one place it's not political um, that has tremendous power over everybody's money. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, Nomi Prince, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, check out her website. It's Nomi, N-O-M-I, Prince, P-R-I-N-S, all one word, dot com. She's an absolutely uh, prolific writer, a very interesting and smart person, and we, we appreciate her time so much this weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.